This week, we're talking all about what kind of rate of return or return on equity or other financial number indicator, et cetera, should you be looking for when you choose just the right business to buy? I'm David C. Barnett, and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the podcast, YouTube channel, and blog where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium sized businesses while controlling risk. So if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day, or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things, I talk to interesting people, and I answer your questions every week right here. So be sure to hit like and be sure to hit subscribe, and let's get to it. Special thanks go to today's video sponsor, Mark Willis of Lake Growth Financial. Mark helps people better manage their personal wealth and business finances through the bank on yourself insurance strategy. This is something I've done personally and I've gotten lots of positive feedback from people I've worked with over the years. Go to newbankingsolution.com to find a playlist of all the interviews I've done with Mark and to learn more about the advantages of these programs. While there, sign up to arrange a conversation about what this solution might look like for you. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. So this week, uh, I'm not answering a specific question. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm creating a video to answer a group, a particular tranche of continuous and constant questions that I'm being faced with all over the place. Uh, and so, you know, I have one here recently, uh, an Instagram comment from Sam, uh, who talks about, you know, rates of return and things like that, that he looks for in stock market investing and is trying to compare them with what he should be looking for in small business investing. Uh, I also had an exchange just a few days ago from the date I recorded this um, with a fellow on Twitter who, and I'll read his tweet. He says, um, I compared two companies, EBITDA of 244,000 versus 440,000. Uh, and then he has the you know return on investment and the return on equity and all this kind of stuff. And he's, and, and he's asking, you know, which one should I buy? And so my my video today is going to be largely based upon that conversation that I had on Twitter, um, and I and I I get this kind of question. I understand, um, and it's not coming from the traditional business buyer that I met back when I used to own my business brokerage. Uh, it's really a function of, of this new element in the market, which is the search funder phenomenon, where you have these people that have gone through business school, you know, MBA graduates, and they've spent a lot of years in that university environment and learning, you know, spreadsheets and doing financial analysis. And uh, they've learned a lot about things like investing, maybe in stock markets, stock analysis, et cetera. And they're trying to bring that toolkit into the world of small business. And the big, 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 big difference between big businesses, publicly traded firms, and small business is that when you analyze a big publicly traded firm, you're analyzing a company as a going concern with the entire leadership team intact. And you can look at the numbers and you can make a decision and you're going to buy into the company as well as the leadership team. So if you like the direction things are going and there's a stable cohort of leaders there and you, you're basically going in with them and they're going to carry on their plan, whatever it is, right? In the world of small business, we're often talking about businesses that are largely driven by the personality of the owner who is in there managing things, directing things, uh, even if it's not the day-to-day -day manager of the business. Um, there's a certain C-suite level of functionality that never gets given to a paid manager. It always is going to reside with the owner, even if that owner is doing other things and they're only spending a few hours a week on the business. You know, major capital improvements, banking, you know, decisions about major marketing campaigns, change in product offerings, all that kind of stuff ultimately is going to be driven by the owner. And when you buy a small business, that leadership function departs and you have to fill the role. And so let me tell you just a, a little bit about why strictly using these numbers is not entirely the best way to analyze if you're kind of trying to compare between two different small business opportunities. So one of the areas that I think is really important for you to look at uh, beyond the numbers is the characteristics. So we're talking about things like the employees that are there, 
the processes that are in place, what kind of customer mix it has between business or you know consumer walk up retail customers, for example, or is there a customer concentration issue? Um, how capital intensive is the business? Does it require a lot of big pieces of machinery to be purchased and replaced frequently? Uh, these kinds of things. So we're we're looking at the characteristics of the business, and you can have two different businesses, especially if you're looking at you know broker for sale websites, for example, you could have two businesses with similar sales numbers, similar SDE or EBITDA. And when you dig into these things, you realize that the cash flow from one could be much better than the cash flow from the other because of all of the things that come after those notional cash flow levels, CapEx being one of those things. Then you want to analyze what are the opportunities for these businesses? And so if they're in two different markets, those markets may have different forward-looking opportunities, right? Um, and so you want to look at what are the opportunities? And in particular, do you have the skills as the new leader to either bring the business into those new opportunities or fix the business if it has some problems? Now, let's focus on fixing because this is important. Oftentimes, when we're looking at smaller, medium-sized businesses, if you strictly look at the numbers, you might see that one performs better than the other. Does that mean you should buy the better performing one? Don't forget, the price of a business is based on the cash flow. It's, you know, it should not be based on your perception of what you can do with the business. That's called Blue Sky, and I've got videos on Blue Sky, and we'll link to one and have it floating up here. Um, so the price you pay is based to the current, based on the current performance. So there is a very strong argument to say that if you find a business that has problems that is still cash flow positive, and those problems are something that you know how to fix, that's the opportunity because you can buy that business at a lower price. You can then fix the problem and improve the cash flow, maybe without even increasing the sales. And then you end up with a more valuable asset that you got at a discount because the current owner wasn't operating at you know the the most efficient capacity now be careful about this because some people can really fall victim to, to hubris in, in this kind of scenario um especially if you are believing that you know a lot of the stuff you've been taught is going to give you some kind of advantage oftentimes we're talking to business sellers who have decades of experience in a particular market. And I, I often question people when, you know, when they say, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. I'm like, okay, well, those things may work. Uh, we have to explore why the seller hasn't done them. Or if the seller has explored those options, you know, why did they choose not to do it? And, and there could be reasons why someone didn't do it. Older owner doesn't want to embrace new technology, doesn't want to learn new things. That happens, right? And it can create opportunities with efficiency, you know, new app-driven um, solutions to help track processes and you know where workers are and keep track of time and better costing and all that kind of stuff. Those opportunities are definitely out there. So you focus on what you can do with it. That's going to give you the reason to buy. As far as all of those other numbers, here's what's important is that you have a positive cash flow beyond the things you know you're going to have to cover, including debt service. And so debt service is a is an interesting thing because when you make the payment to the bank, it's the payment you make is a combination of interest and principal. Interest is an expense for tax purposes. Principal repayment is not. You borrow money from the bank. It's not a taxable event. It's not sales. It's you borrowed the money. And when it goes back, it doesn't affect your taxes either. It's non-taxable coming out of the bank to you. Non-tax, it doesn't affect taxes going back into the bank. So the principal payment that you make is part of the profit of the business, okay? So it's going to be subject to taxes. And so you have to make sure that when you're doing your cash flow forecast, that you know that you're going to be cash flow positive when you buy this business. And as long as you are, you now have infinite runway to implement the changes that you think that you can implement to improve the business. Right. And if, if you're uncertain about how to properly do a, a cash flow forecast, um, then I would suggest you head on over to um, this website, which is bizplanschool.com. 
where you can sign up for my cash flow forecasting and business plan writing program. It's like a 13 week program that I created with a beta group of testers. And every week I did step by step, we start with a blank spreadsheet and I teach you how to build an accurate cash flow forecast specifically for the business that you're looking at. And there's five sample companies. And every week I apply the new uh, lesson to each of the five companies and they have five different characteristics. So that one's got inventory, one built, built things custom, one is a retail uh, environment, um, one is a seasonal business, uh, two of them are um, acquisitions and three of them are new startups. So, and we carry you right through so you can build an accurate cash flow forecast and then create the business plan that would then be put before uh, a banker or investors, for example, to try to secure funding to do the deal. So now that the commercial is over now, so you do your deal, you buy the business and you're operating, things are going well. Here's where it changes a little bit. Because now that you own a business in this industry and you now are an expert in how things function after you've been in there and you've been managing the business, let's say then you decide you want to go and you want to start to acquire other businesses in the same industry and you're going to roll them up or tuck them into your existing business. This is where the numbers and analysis can actually become a shortcut for you because now you know how this kind of business operates. So you can look at another business in the same industry. You can look at what their sales are, what their earnings are, what their costs are, and you can benchmark it against yourself. And this is where you can start to create some numerical shortcuts that help you more quickly triage whether something is a good opportunity or not. So some of the uh, the members of the Business Buyer Adventure Group Coaching Program are doing this. They're, they've acquired multiple businesses within a specific category. And now they can more quickly look at these other businesses, you know, by looking at certain numbers and they'll know if they would be running that business more or less efficiently than the current owner. And that will give them an indication about whether or not it makes sense for them to dive in and take a closer look at that business. And it's interesting because as they get to know their industry more and more, the primary things that they examine when they're looking at these acquisition opportunities are not necessarily the numbers. It's things like customer concentration or you know the employee mix and, and things like that because they know what the challenges of their industry are. If uh, if it's you know finding qualified workers, for example, then that's one of the things that they're going to look at. Is they're going to say, well, what are the ages of the people that are in the business? Because I know how I know how hard it is to hire. I don't want to buy a business that has a bunch of people who may be retiring in the next couple of years. That that would represent a threat to the continued, uh, you know, functioning of that business. Anyway, um, so I love the feedback. I love the comments. I love that you guys uh, want to ask for my opinion in these in these analyses that you do. Um, but it's not just about the numbers in the world of small business. You have to get under the hood because, um, you know, you're not, you know, if you want to use a, the car analogy, a big publicly traded uh, business, you know, you're going to buy shares. It's like paying, paying a bus fare. You get on the bus, you get to ride with everyone else. And, uh, you know, the driver is taking care of where you're going and steering the wheel and someone else is taking care of all the mechanical stuff. And you just, you're on your way with everyone in the world of small business. It's more like a car where the, the driver is going to get out and hand you the keys. And then you are the one now responsible for deciding when and how and, and where you go. Anyway, thanks very much, everyone. And, uh, and we'll see you next time. Uh, keep sending in the questions and, uh, and I'll keep making the videos. Cheers. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses? Easy. Head over to my blog site at davidcbarnett.com. You'll find hundreds of articles and videos all for free. You'll find links to my books and online courses, and you can sign up for my email list and get emails covering topics that interest you and be notified of new videos.